This afternoon, we're in the city of Round Rock. We're at the bridge that was dedicated in 2017 as a commemoration to the 90th anniversary of the tragedy of the Immortal Tent. Our goal in this retelling of the story of the Immortal Ten is to be inspired by the Baylor spirit. Not just school spirit, but what we know as the Baylor spirit. Over the years, 10 students have become a symbol of that spirit. In 1927, Baylor had high hopes for their basketball team. Several promising starters were returning from the 26th team and many predicted that the Bears would be leading contenders for the conference title. The Bears' first road game of the new year was to be held in Austin against the University of Texas. The Longhorns had defeated Baylor on our home court just before Christmas in 1926, but the Bears were confident they would bring home a win. On the morning of Saturday, January 22, 1927, the Baylor basketball team and their coach and several other Baylor students boarded the athletic bus to take them to Austin. As they pulled out of Waco, a misty rain began to fall. And in Temple, Baylor student Ivy Foster, who was hitchhiking to his home in Taylor, jumped on the bus. As they traveled south toward Austin, visibility grew steadily worse with fog and condensation covering all the windows. And as a result, the driver had slowed down to about 20 miles per hour. As the bus crested a hill on the south side of the community of Round Rock, approaching the tracks of a railroad, the driver and the passengers neither heard nor saw a train until they were startled by a piercing whistle coming through the fog. The Illinois and Great Northern Railway train, known as the Sunshine Special, was almost upon them. The slick road made stopping impossible, and so they accelerated, thinking that they could beat the train across the track. When the driver realized the bus was not fast enough, he pulled the steering wheel hard to the left to veer parallel to the tracks. And as the bus swung diagonally across the rails, the locomotive, traveling at more than 60 miles per hour, struck the right rear corner of the bus, ripping the top and sides away from the chassis. Green and gold jerseys could be found scattered along the tracks for hundreds of yards. And in the aftermath, six men lay dead, while four others were dying. All 22 passengers received some type of injury. Ambulances and even the train carried the dead and injured to nearby hospitals in Taylor and Georgetown. Upon hearing the tragic news, friends, relatives, and officials from Baylor and the University of Texas rushed to the area. In the days that followed, people all over the nation mourned the loss of these fine students, sending letters and telegrams by the thousand. Understandably, the Baylor campus was in a state of shock. And in the final count, 12 survived the tragedy, but 10 did not. And so today, with the telling of this story, we pay tribute to the 10 who lost their lives on January 22, 1927. First, Jack Castellaw, a pre-law student from Ennis, Texas. Jack was an enthusiastic young man who loved athletics. He was a team manager, a very popular campus figure, and certainly had the makings for a fine career at the Baylor Law School. Today, we know about Jack through the gifts from his family who helped provide the Castellaw Communications Building in his honor. Second, Sam Dillo. Sam was the third generation from his family to attend Baylor. He had a deep love for the school. He was from Fort Worth, 
and was the cool-headed captain of our team. He played varsity football, baseball, and served as the first junior to be elected captain of our basketball team. He was an active member and leader of the Baylor Chamber of Commerce and was remembered by his friends as a man with overflowing energy. And Sam was the roommate of Merle Dudley. Merle Dudley was from Abilene, Texas and the only Yell leader to make the trip. He was a native of Abilene and a transfer student to Baylor. He was known for his leadership and enthusiasm and Merle had, was already in the Baylor Law School, and it was said that he was always eager to serve others. Fourth, Ivy Foster Jr. Ivy was that freshman kid hitchhiking home to Taylor who lived in the dorm and was simply catching that ride on the Baylor bus. We're told that as the bus slowed for a stop sign in Temple, he literally reached out, caught onto the side mirror of the bus and swung up onto the doorstep. I guess he was planning to ride to Taylor, hanging on to the outside of the bus. Well, one of the seniors inside took pity on the poor freshman and let him in, giving him his seat. And Ivy actually was well known to all the passengers on the bus because he played both freshman basketball and football. A friend described Ivy at his funeral by saying he exhibited those traits of sportsmanship, perseverance, and sacrificial determination that go into the composition of athletes and good men. Fifth, Bob Haley. Bob was a sophomore and a native of Lot. He was known by his friends as smiling Bob Haley because of his perennial cheerfulness. They said he was the perfect example of youth combined with physical manhood. Bob continually bubbled over with joy and enthusiasm, friendship, and smiling Bob Haley is remembered for his never tiring efforts to do his best no matter what the task. Sixth, Robert Lee Bob Hanna was a sophomore, originally from Waco, though his family had moved to St. Louis, Missouri. He was small in size, but fought his way up from a substitute on the freshman team to become a starter on the varsity squad in only one year. Friends said he was an excellent defensive player, always worked for the team rather than for himself. The qualities of conscientious trainer Hard worker and good sport made Bob a leading contender for all conference honors. Seventh, Willis Murray. Willis was a native of Gatesville. He was both a manager and a player, and Willis was smart. Having finished high school early, he was an 18-year-old junior student at Baylor. It was said that he was a quiet, unassuming young man who was instantly liked by everyone that he met. Willis left behind many friends because he had been a friend to many. Eighth, James Stephen Walker. Jimmy was a country boy from Gatesville. He was Baylor's main offensive thrust. And it was said that Jimmy played each game as if the championship was at stake. He was also a standout in track and field and was considered to be an athlete of great stamina. Jimmy was a keen competitor who always enjoyed the sweet taste of victory after a hard fought game. Ninth, William Penn Winchester. He was a substitute in both football and basketball. It was said that he made others hustle in order to hold on to their starting positions. He was very involved in campus as well as community life and served in several honorary organizations. At his funeral, William was described as a very sincere individual who constantly worked to improve not only as an athlete, but as a man. And last, Clyde Abe Kelly Jr. 
It was said that Abe was probably the best all-round athlete to ever wear a green and gold uniform. He was a letterman in football, basketball, and baseball. And as a senior, he was the captain of our football team. Abe was one of Baylor's most beloved athletes and students. However, Abe will not be remembered for his athletic prowess alone. For it was he who exemplified the ultimate in courage and self-sacrifice. In the split second before the train hit, Abe saved the life of his best friend by pushing him through a window in the rear of the bus. It is that act of selflessness that helped define the Baylor spirit. Now, fast forward with me to the fall semester of 1927, the beginning of the football season. Eight months had gone by since the tragedy, and Baylor coach Morley Jennings and the Baylor football team were still reeling from the loss of so many of their great players. They were remembering, hurting, grieving, and they needed leadership and a renewed spirit. And so the team voted that their team captain should still be Abe Kelly and that his spirit, along with the others who died with him, would lead their team for the year. And so officially, the Baylor spirit became solidified in the mind of all of Baylor as the spirit of the immortal ten. Today, the names of these men are recalled each year as a part of the traditions of Baylor University. And their names are on one of the most moving and truly unique statues in all the Baylor campus. Students, you need to know that that statue was placed there by the students of Baylor, who wanted to be sure that the story and the spirit of the Immortal Ten would never be forgotten. I am blessed to have been invited to work at Baylor after graduating. Part of my job was visiting with alumni and prospective students and helping raise scholarship dollars that today are being invested in Baylor students. Early in the fall of 1985, I was asked by the Baylor Chamber of Commerce to prepare and share the story of the Immortal Ten for homecoming. It was the middle of September and I had just begun reading obituaries and newspaper articles and preparing. Well, on a Saturday before a home game, part of my real job took me to the Bobo Student Ministry Center. And there I was able to meet a group of alumni at a reception held on campus. Everyone was standing around in little groups talking, wearing name tags, and I saw that there was a really lively gentleman standing over with a group surrounding him, telling stories about his time on campus. I saw that he graduated in 1930, and he was telling the group about his student days, how he had been an athlete, had played basketball. And so I waited until we could be somewhat alone in the crowd, and I introduced myself. And I asked if he might have known, uh, trying to think, of uh, Ivy Foster or, or Abe Kelly or, or Jack Castellan. Well, no sooner had these names passed my lips than did his countenance change. Huge tears began falling from his eyes. And I said, these are part of the Immortal Ten. I'm doing research. I'm going to be telling the story to our freshman class. And he held his hand up and he stopped. Me. And he said, it is very hard for me to think back on those men. You see, they were all my friends. I was the driver of that bus. And as he said this, the huge tears fell from his eyes just as they began to form in my own. For that was the first time the Baylor spirit truly captured me. While I had known about this Baylor spirit, I had heard the story of the Immortal Ten. 
I was never truly captured by the Spirit until it became a living, breathing person that was experiencing with me at that moment. This is a story that's told at homecoming, but the Baylor spirit is far greater than a symbolic flame or a bonfire or supporting our team in a great win. The Baylor spirit came alive, not because of those who died, but because who lived that spirit every day. That is the spirit of Baylor. The spirit wrapped up in students like those you came with and come with and visit with each day. Those that you pass as you walk down the hall in class. The Baylor spirit is wrapped up in a tradition of friendship that you hold sacred today and every day of your Baylor life. I love looking at that statue of the Immortal Ten. It is a beautiful testimony to what students can do to share and uphold the Baylor spirit. I like to walk close to it and study the faces of those that are looking back, looking out. Try it. Go look at the face of Abe Kelly and others who are depicted there. Try to be drawn into their story. But what you'll see is that their eyes are not looking back at you. I like to think that they're looking out into the future, into the eyes of the class of 2024 and all the Baylor family who are entrusted to carry on the Baylor spirit.